In some places, it will be a store of values. In some places, it would have completely eaten the fiat currency and the suddenly moment is there while we're still in the gradual moment. I never questioned the dollar. Like, who questions the dollar? The problem with gold is, at some point, once it gets as valuable as gold got, you get into a problem, which is, how do I subdivide it into more pieces? So you need to look for a substitute. In that case, people started using silver. But with Bitcoin, because it's digital, that changes everything most things i learned in bitcoin i had no idea about throughout my entire career we need more salespeople in bitcoin we have a lot of genius builders but i think we need more salespeople i think and we need to convince the rich crowd people with a lot of money to get in i loved your first pin tweet and i just want to get in with this tweet and then we get in all the other topics mm -hmm. uh, from there you said Everything is going to zero against Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Why is that? The reason I tweeted that was because I was a little bit frustrated, to be honest, that I had to keep answering the same questions all over again. But that's probably because it, we're so early still in Bitcoin. And uh, the questions are usually, what about this other coin, you know? What about the dollar price of Bitcoin, right? And all these questions that we Bitcoiners keep hearing, that they come over and over and over again. And I love, for example, the website, I'm pretty sure you know, Priced in Bitcoin. Yes, it's amazing. Yeah. So that website is pure signal, by the way. Anyone, anyone who hasn't seen it yet just go check it out maybe you can put it in your show notes it's a really good one so basically what 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 uh, they do is they price everything in bitcoin and uh, the moment you check the list there it's just all going down mm -hmm. everything is trending in one direction which is towards zero so everything priced like real estate gold dollars, any other cryptocurrency, anything, as soon as you change the denominator and you start pricing things in BTC, you have a completely different picture. And that picture is mm. everything is going down. Nothing is actually going up. Everything is going down. Yeah, it's, it's we talked a little bit about before also investing in stuff. Um, once you adopt the Bitcoin standard, it's really hard to make any other investments. It's like the, yeah. it becomes the new hurdle rate. You think about any bigger investment twice. For me, it does not uh, does not um, uh, change the way I think when I'm in the supermarket. Yeah. But anything above like a thousand euros or at least even a five hundred euros, I think about it twice. I'm like this could be some bitcoins. This could be some sats. Like why don't I do it in Bitcoin rather than do I really need that right now? Yeah, yeah. It's it's also a mindset, right? And it takes time. I mean, for me, it took years until I started really thinking like that, right? Mm. So I started in November 18. That was the first time I really got into the topic, you know? And, you know, you start, I mean, everybody starts from a different angle, but my start was because I have a financial background. My start was, hey, I want to I wanna make money, you know? I want to make more dollars. I want to make more, more euros, right? Whatever that currency is that you price everything in. So that's how I got started. And um, from there, once you really dive into this topic, you at some point change the denominator, the denominator, right? So everything you look at, every investment, every purchasing decision, you said it right. Anything above a certain threshold, that you actually care about spending it because it's a higher amount, you think twice, like, do I really, really, really need that right now? Like, mm. should I really buy that? <laughs> <laughs> or should I just wait and just hold Bitcoin? Yeah, that's, that's so true. Also, before we go into your <clears throat> trade, trade fair story, which yeah. I'm really interested in, um, you also said before, when new people come into Bitcoin, they always ask the same questions. For yeah. example, like, What's the next Bitcoin? I got that a lot. Like, oh, mm -hmm. Bitcoin is interesting, but can you refer any other coins? Yeah. I always ask myself, why is that? I think the one thing is probably unit bias. Do, do you have like, is, is unit bias because Bitcoin is priced so high in terms of like one Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. 
uh, is that the major thing or what does people why do people not tend towards bitcoin in the first place and then like oh let's let's see if there's something else i think there is many reasons and uh you know how it is right as bitcoiners because we have already passed that threshold of understanding it's very hard to remember what we thought before mm -hmm. that right that's very okay. once you wake up from the matrix it's very hard to believe or or have empathy with the with the other world how they think right so it's the same or a similar thing but if i try to remember it's just confusion it's the lack of understanding what money is mm -hmm. how money works and the game theory behind money right and if you just study this topic long enough you realize and i love the piece of um parker lewis mm -hmm in his gradually then suddenly series specifically i mean one piece of that series completely changed my mindset was where he says that monetary mediums trend to a single unit so over time the market the open free market actually doesn't want multiple currencies for a very simple reason we want convenience we want to agree on one unit to price things right no actually if you studied gold for example how gold emerged and how it really got into the place it got it was not like a government showed up and said hey gold is the currency right now right it was an emergence over time where humans chose gold over other monetary mediums mm. and we converged on gold over time as the most or the single most used form of money right because of the game theory behind uh, money right which is a winner take all game right it's a winner take all game you cannot it's inconvenient for people to uh, start using multiple currencies to trade, right? It's very inconvenient. It, it's hard for the accounting system. Uh, it has hundreds of reasons, right, that we could dive into. But uh, that's the main reason why you cannot actually have another Bitcoin. Mm. And like if we, for example, look at gold, for example, we could say, OK, wait a second, Ruzbe, we had gold, we had silver true but the difference there is gold is made of atoms gold is physical right the problem with gold is at some point once it gets very valuable as valuable as gold got you got you get into a problem which is how do i subdivide it into more pieces even if this amount of gold is already worth hundreds of thousands of dollars right or purchasing power right so you need to look for a substitute. In that case, people started using silver, right? But with Bitcoin, because it's digital, that changes everything, right? Because finally, we have a scarce digital good that we can actually divide infinitely. Mm. And, and one and another thing that I want to add here is like, <clears throat> Isn't Bitcoin the first thing that is truly just there for money? When you look at gold, it has also yeah. use cases in, in other uh, realms, like it, it's industrial use, it's all in all smartphones in there. Yes. Like Bitcoin is kind of the, the first thing that just is money. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people don't get, right? Yes. And uh, I want to steal a quote from a friend, a uh, fellow Bitcoiner. Uh, he knows who he knows that I'm talking about him. Don't want to mention his name. Um, he says it very nicely. He says, we actually never had money. Mm. We never had money before Bitcoin. We only had substitutes or mimics of perfect money. Right. So for the first time in human history, we have something that has perfected every aspect of what humans have always been looking for, mm. right? To do commerce, to do trade freely without having the issues of rehypification, trust, 
transportation and uh, divisibility and all these issues that we had. And just gold was just the only thing we had, right? So we, we didn't have anything else. So we the market forces converged onto gold because there was no alternative, right? And I would argue right now, there is no alternative to Bitcoin today. Although we're so early and Bitcoin is very small compared to gold or any other monetary asset. But yeah, so I would say Bitcoin is a form of money that solves every problem humans have been trying to solve for hundreds, if not thousands of years. It's finally here. Very few see it yet. And that's why we're early. And that's why it's a huge opportunity, in my opinion. And that's why uh, we should spread the word and, and let as many people know as we can. It's, I, I love it already. It's really cool. Yes. Uh, and especially like we are so like go in any forum that talks about cryptos, not Bitcoin, yeah. talk in any forum that talk about real estate or gold and ask the, yeah, hey, what do, what, guy, what do you guys think about Bitcoin? Then you know how early we are. <laughs> yes, yes. It, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, but let's come to your uh, trade fi, traditional finance uh, background. Yes. Um, maybe start in the beginning. Like, How did you get started with traditional finance? Uh, and then what did you do there? And then we can see how you or why you switched to Bitcoin. Yes, sure. Uh, before we jump there, I, I, I think I forgot a point I wanted to make uh, yeah. with the question regarding altcoins or any other cryptocurrency. Because I think this is a question that many people have in their head. And it's still not very clear because we just explained Bitcoin is divisible and so on and so forth. So unit bias is one problem. But the other thing is not understanding network effects, right? And what do I mean by that? So for example, we use for communication most of the time here in Europe, we use WhatsApp, yeah. right? That's an app that we are used to and that has the most network effect. If I now come to you and say, hey, Robin, I have a new app only I use it, it's more, it's faster, it's better looking, it's lighter, it's more private, right? Privacy is a problem with WhatsApp. Try to convince hundreds of your friends to join you, mm. okay? Very difficult, if not impossible, right? However, let's take the argument that it is possible that because you like me you want to stay in touch with me and i don't use any other application you will do me the favor and download the application mm -hmm. okay it's still somehow possible but it's still very difficult to convince you you you're even reluctant to do it even though it's just an application you have no loss of doing it right now let's talk about money if i come and say hey i have a new new form of money robin that i produced in my basement I promise there is a certain amount of it. Just believe me, <laughs> it's better than Bitcoin. It's faster than Bitcoin. And it has this amazing, you know, possibilities of doing smart contracts and all sorts of things. Like how difficult is it to gain the same network effect that the most dominant alternative already has? Even if you're more private, even if you're faster, it is impossible, right? It's very difficult. It's difficult already with a normal messaging app. It's even more difficult with a monetary asset. Why? Because in order to convince you to do what I just told you, you have to have, you have to sell the monetary asset that most people use in order to buy mine. So you have also a monetary disincentive to do that, mm. right? With a messaging app, it's already difficult, but there at least you don't have any, you know, monetary disadvantage if you do switch or add it into the existing apps that you use. With monetary networks, that's not, that's not true because you always have an opportunity cost. If you don't hold Bitcoin, you have to hold something else. Mm. And if you just look over the past four years, any alternative to Bitcoin has not gone up against Bitcoin. Everything is down if you look four plus years back. So just wanted to add that as a context because a lot of people say, okay, wait, I get it with gold. It's 
divisibility, whatever. But what about the alternative coins, right? And it's also money is the most viral thing. Yeah. Uh, and it spreads faster and better than yes. any other form of uh, assets or communication, whatever. Um, yes. But then um, is that why it might take long to break fiat, even though fiat is so bad? Like you hold it, you will, you know that you will lose all your purchasing power over 50, 60 years. Over your lifetime, you will lose everything. Um And still people are like, ah, no, I, I trust the government. No, it, it's okay. It's it's like, it's it's stable in the short term. Um, is that the reason why they hold on to it so much? That's an excellent point. I love it. So exactly. That's exactly the point I'm trying to make, right? Let's not even stay here in Europe. Let's go somewhere where the currency even is even 100 times worse. Okay, let's go to Turkey. Mm. Okay. What's the most dominant currency? Turkish Lira. <laughs> What's the inflation rate in Turkey? Hundreds of percent. Network effects are insanely powerful, insanely powerful, right? Everything is priced in it, right? And even if, even if you go to Turkey, you, you will see a lot of uh, taxi drivers and hotels have started pricing things in euros, right? Because their currency is just really, it's terrible right they have mm. lost so much of their purchasing power over the past few years but still the currency is turkish lira <laughs> at the end at the at the moment of payment you have to exchange it uh, for turkish lira in order to pay the person however the, the, this is the mistake that a lot of uh, bitcoiners who are in the us and by the way i'm iranian so i i can empathize from the side of the Middle East more than probably most Bitcoiners who live in the US and who grew up in a fairly more stable economy, right? Mm. So we don't have to have a fiat currency die for Bitcoin to succeed. In fact, I believe that none of us will be able to see most fiat currencies die in our lifetimes, okay? Look at Argentina, look at Turkey, look at uh, Iran, look at all these countries, right, where their currency mm -hmm. is has been this has been has been disrupted for how many years and they're still working, but people do not use it to store their wealth with, mm -hmm. right? So we can go on for tens of years. I mean, the dollar will be the last currency to, to vanish from planet Earth. That I can be 100% sure because it's even more used outside of the US than in the US, right? Yeah. Because it's a world reserve currency. So Bitcoin could go easily to millions of dollars per coin. And we would still be around pricing things in dollars, paying each other for commerce in dollars. You talked before about that uh, Parker Lewis, where we, it's about <clears throat> slowly, then suddenly, this moment. Yes. Even if we're on this suddenly trend, you think that we're still in a in a feared world. Yeah. I, I had last time a guest on Rajat Sony. I don't know if you know him. Uh, he also said, like, even if we're at the million US dollars, yeah, most people will still not have adopted Bitcoin, even as a store of value, because uh, the big money will come in and then... Uh, it, it we're, we're coming to a million dollar price even without mass adoption from retailers like 10 percent uh, maybe 15 percent of people adopting is 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 all that we need um do you see bitcoin as that big store of value and maybe never getting to a medium of exchange because governments don't want to give it up no and i'll tell you why it's actually a very good question so here's the thing what's the difference between bitcoin and gold Gold was analog money and Bitcoin is digital sound money, right? The difference or the main difference is that if you look at gold's history, gold was unable to uh, become, or let, let me start differently. So with gold, you didn't have a communication channel and people were not connected like they are today, right? So gold went through a phase of 
being a store of value for, or even being a collectible first, and then it turned to a store of value. And over hundreds of thousands of years, at some point, it became a medium of exchange mm. worldwide, right? With Bitcoin, I believe it's going to be different. You will have places where it's going to be just a store of value, especially in the West, probably in most places where the fiat currency is not as you know, weak as other places. And in some places, because the suddenly moment is much quicker, Bitcoin will gain more adoption as a medium of exchange. And it's already happening as we speak, right? Why? Because Bitcoin is global. Bitcoin lives on the internet. Bitcoin is accessible to everybody at the same time. With gold, gold had to spread over territories, over years. You know, it took very long time for it to be transported and so on and so forth. So I think Bitcoin will have a similar path, but in every place, it will be at different stages. In some places, it will be a store of value still. In some places, it would have completely eaten the you know, fiat currency and the suddenly moment is there while we're still in the gradual moment. Mm, I, I love it a lot. And I also think that Bitcoin is already globally accepted. Yeah. Because when you think of like, I don't know, when you, you're in Turkey and then you flee to Austria, uh, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I have my Bitcoin. I told the Turkish government that I lost that I lost my Bitcoin. I don't know, they, they got stolen from me. Uh, and then all of a sudden you can go to, I don't know, Wexel or some app where you can really meet a, a physical person and then exchange Bitcoin for local currencies and then buy everything with that. That's yeah. already globally like in every... all. I don't know if every country, but pro probably in almost every country, you can do that today. And yes. That, that's already globally, like it's accepted all everywhere. You can find in every country someone that is willing to exchange the local currency yeah. for your Bitcoin. Show me one place that would accept gold as a medium of exchange. <laughs> that yes. doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Yeah. But with Bitcoin, yeah. I could go right now to El Salvador. I could go to so many places, not only El Salvador. There is so many. I mean, El Salvador is the famous uh, example because they have announced that it's a it's a legal tender currency, right? But there is so many places. I heard my my brother was uh, last year in Cyprus. He was like, I can pay, I can pay almost everywhere here with Bitcoin, like real estate, I can buy with Bitcoin, I can, <laughs> there's shops accepting Bitcoin, like, you know, it's emerging in places because Cyprus is also, you know, the history in Cyprus, right? They, they like the, these areas, they have really gone through a lot of struggle. Mm. They know what it means if the bank shuts the doors, right? They're used to that. So these places who still remember, I mean, Germany doesn't remember hyperinflation. We were not around 100, 100, it was exactly 100 years ago. But none of us remember what happened. I mean, you're in Austria, but you know, I'm from Germany. So no German would be able to tell you or remember what happened 100 years ago. But Germany went through a hyperinflation mm. just 100 years ago. It's unbelievable that actually it's not a long time ago. 100, 100 years ago is not that long ago. Yeah, it, it's fascinating how, how we see it. Um, yeah, let's let's come to the actual yes. question that I had. Before. Yes, yes, sorry, <laughs> I, I, I had to go back a step because I wanted to, no, to I, clarify. I, I love it. It, yeah. it was really cool. But let's uh, let's come to your trade fight history. You yes. started there. Like, why did you start there? So uh, my career started in 07. So it was pretty much the very beginning of the financial crisis. Um, I started working in an investment bank as an intern. I liked it a lot. I tried other, you know, industries. I didn't like it. I, I tried like shipping and uh, stuff like that, import export stuff not really my thing. And I started working in investment banking. I was very young. I was like 19. This this was the start. And um, from there, I observed as a very young individual, the financial crisis, you know, it was unbelievable. I mean, back then, I didn't, 
I didn't think of it much. I realized later what I actually experienced because mm -hmm. for me, everything was new anyways. And it was, you know, I remember my boss came into the office and he said, uh, the day Lehman went bankrupt, he came in and he asked me, hey, Ruzda, what's up? Like, uh, any news in the market? And I was like, yeah, oil is at, uh, like, oil price was at like 100 something dollars. And I just gave him the oil price. You know, we were, I was at the dealing desk and he asked me, hey, what's, what's, what's new? And I told him uh, the oil price. <laughs> and you know, my coworker looked at, looks at me and then looks at him and says, Lehman is bankrupt. And he goes like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, yeah, Lehman is bankrupt, whatever, you know, but it about was oil price. <laughs> about the oil price. Yeah. But yeah, it was it was insane. It was really, really uh, crazy. Mm. I mean, the markets uh, were so volatile and we were dealing with clients, mainly hedge funds. I mean, we had our own hedge fund in the bank, but we were working with external hedge funds who placed their trades with us. Uh, so I was in the middle of all of this and, um, you know, I mean, later on, I, I lived in many places. After that, I, I lived in the US for a while, then in Dubai for a while, then in Switzerland for a while. And I just kept staying in the same industry, went a little bit to commercial banking as well, did some boring stuff like payments and trade finance and stuff like that. But the main part of my career was in investment banking mm. and you know I'm also like a person I'm I'm also a very spiritual person uh, started in 11 uh, really focusing on some gurus I followed uh, like Eckhart Tolle is a great great person that I started to follow and later on Alan Watts and stuff like that so uh, I, I'm really also interested in uh, topics like philosophy and religion, not really religion, but, you know, these topics, like philosophical um, uh, topics. And I, and why do I say that? I was actually never able to link these two worlds with each other. Mm. Like my career in banking was always linked to an ego that had to basically lie to be successful. Because the game, the basic game of banking is you benefit if your clients don't know or lose. That's how it goes. That, that's literally how it goes. And you don't think of it like in bad ways because you're like, you just accept reality the way it is. You're like, this is the way it is. I, if I don't do that, I'm not going to be successful. So I have to do it. Right? That's also one reason why many people in traditional finance are trapped because the incentive is to lie. The incentive is to cheat. The incentive is to sell something you don't believe in. Mm. Right. And I was thinking similarly until Bitcoin. You know, in 2017, I heard of it for the first time, ignored it didn't think any of it like at all in 18 was my first time where I got really involved and bought some amount that I thought of being a lot for me that back then. And from there, I just went deeper and deeper and deeper and uh, sorry to become a little bit philosophical, but uh, I thought it's very interesting to share this because it was also a very awakening moment for me. So I was listening to uh, Guy Swan, you know him, obviously. And he was reading this article of um, Robert Breedlove. Uh, the article's name was The Number Zero. And when I was listening to that article, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is actually a financial product that is completely ethical. Like you have something that is actually win-win. Yeah. It's not win-lose because we have fair rules on the very, very base level of having a fixed unit that everybody has to share. There is no way to produce more in the unit of the, of the, of the medium that we're going to use and price things in. 
And that was like, wow. And that was, I would say, that was like the most orange pilling moment. I had many orange pilling moments, but that was one of the most amazing orange pilling moments because the two worlds that I always like separated from each other finally converged. And I was like, so now I can be ethical. I don't have to lie. I can be honest. I can talk about something and be completely passionate about it and love it and believe in it and win while others also win, which is the exact opposite of the fiat system, right? So that was my transition from, you know, traditional finance. I got into Bitcoin not as early as some others, but <laughs> I wish I had, but I didn't. So yeah, that was a transition for me. Yeah, I already talked with some OGs <clears throat> that are over 10 years in the space and I'm so envy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they, uh, even, even though I was 14, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could have heard of it because I was actually in finance and yeah. I was working, but uh, I didn't. So I, I have no regrets, to be honest, because no one ever told me about it. And it was not like I ignored it and then the price w went up, you know. I, the moment I actually ignored it, the price came down. So oh, I was able to buy a little bit cheaper than the first time I heard of it. So that was the good part. So Yeah, it's usually you ignore it, the price shoots up 100%, yeah. then you buy it, then it goes down 50%. Yes, that's the usual <laughs> process. Exactly. Exactly. Well, it was also with me like that. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, the first time I heard about it was in, was in December 17. Then I was like, let me buy some. I was living in Zurich and I just, I will never forget that day. I took my credit card and I bought like 700 Swiss francs of Bitcoin. And then it just went down and down and down and down. It went from 17,000 all the way down to six. And I was like, that's it. I'm going to sell. So I sold and I was like, before it goes to zero, let me just sell it. I, I didn't have a clue what I, what I even bought. Right. So. And then you bought again. And then after, like, because my brother was into it, he kept telling me about it. And because he was doing business with it, like, mm. uh, I heard about it from him again. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to buy. And maybe I can tell you that story as well. So the moment I bought, it was in November 18. Everybody can go and check the price. November 18, I bought at around like 5,800. Four days after I bought, it crashed 50%. <laughs> and I was like, what the heck? Like it went from 5.5 five to 3.2. Yeah. And I was like, but that, this time I'm not going to, you know, I just held and held. And, you know, you know where the price is right now. So I never sold those coins. Really cool. Yeah. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and secure curious way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistics. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order, plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video. Yeah, it's, it's like Bitcoin um, rewards the patient people yeah. that actually do the research and actually mm -hmm. um, investigate themselves what Bitcoin is and not just like blindly follow someone or something like that. Because if you just copy someone, you will get out at some point. Yeah. If it crashes down 50, 60 percent, it all like they, they, they will get out of the Bitcoin. And that's that's such a beautiful thing to have in Bitcoin. Uh, and it's also like this this fair instruments, fair asset, as you said, the ethical asset. Yes. Um, <clears throat> what maybe, which is interesting, you were a long time in uh, the investment banking sector and, and traditional finance, if you call it like that. Mm -hmm. 
what were some learnings from that that you took to to Bitcoin? Something positive from that world that you converted to Bitcoin? That's a really good question. So um, first of all, let me just before I answer the question, say that most things I learned in Bitcoin, I had no idea about throughout my entire career. Like I, Bitcoin made me finally realize that I don't know shit. Like, I don't know <laughs> anything. I don't know anything about money. I don't know anything about actually finance. I don't know anything. Like I didn't know my industry. Mm. This was my realization. I don't know much. Like I, I know how markets work, uh, but I never questioned the dollar. Like who questions the dollar, right? So Bitcoin made me question everything, but what I did take with me, and I have to say that because it really helped, was not to trade. Because I was sitting always on the other side of the table uh, because I was a prime broker. So we had clients like, um, you know, hedge funds, banks, but also individuals who were trading with us. I did not trade myself, but clients were trading with us, right? Mm. So I saw their portfolios and I saw what happened with them. I mean, you won't believe it. Doctors, nurses, like, and even I could not tell them come and trade. You know, I honestly saying, I mean, uh, there were times where I had to, you know, not say a lot of things, but there were times where I said, listen, the, the chances of you losing money is over 90%. And they still did it. I had one client, he took a loan of $200,000 and lost it everything by trading currencies like, you know, Forex trading. He traded euro dollar and pound euros and whatever and lost it all, you know. And I even told him, hey, listen, this is not a good idea. You should probably not do this. He still did it. But long story short, to answer your question, in my entire career, and it was probably 16 years in being a broker, I saw three clients making money. Three. It's insane how, like, it's, it's better to go gamble in a casino than trade. And the odds are just so low, and there is mathematical reason I could line in front of you and explain to you why we don't have to do that now. But, you know, it's it's very difficult. It's extremely difficult, especially for people who don't have a lot of capital, right? Because there is something called leverage in trading that most people use in order to make money quickly. And the way that works is you, for example, Robin, come to me and open an account. You have only $10,000 but you would like to turn this $10,000 to $20,000 as quickly as possible. So if you would go and buy 10,000 euros with your dollars, you would get 9,000 something euros in exchange because of the exchange rate, right? Yeah. But for you to make 20,000, you have to wait for the euro to go up by, I don't know how much percent, a lot, right? A lot, a huge amount. Like it doesn't, like it, it won't make you rich that quickly, right? Mm. So what do you have to do in order to make that possible? You have to take a leveraged position, right? A one to 10 position or one to 20 position. So you start to trade $100,000 against euros with 10,000. So you have $10,000 on your account, but you're able to 10x leverage that and trade 100,000. And we were even like the place I worked at, not me personally, but the banks and the entire industry, they offer one to 100 leverage, wow. one to 200. If you go to places like that are not really regulated, like plus 500 and all those eToro and all those gambling, terrible, terrible companies, in my opinion, they do evil, in my opinion. If you go there, they give you 500 to one leverage. Mm. So people take a huge amount of risk, which can make them a lot of money, but and it might. But the problem is your psychology doesn't work that way. 
The moment you make $1,000 out of your 10,000, guess what you're going to do? You're going to close the position, yeah. right? But the moment you make a, <clears throat> a loss of $1,000, guess what, guess what you're going to do? You're going to leave it open and wait. That's a psychology of humans. They, they don't like losses. They love profits, but they don't like losses. So they keep the losses going and going and going and they limit their profits. Mm -hmm. Right. And with a leverage position, one move can margin call you and you're at zero instantly. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's why the odds are completely against you. In fact, if you look at the FX market, how big is it? Six trillion dollars in volume year over year. So, sorry, not year over year. Daily turnover. Wow. Daily turnover. It's the biggest market in the world, FX market, right? Currency market. So the fiat market, if you will. <laughs> so uh, on a daily basis, the volume is around five to six trillion every day. Volume being traded, right? Out of that volume, not over 90% of traders lose money. Now, imagine how much money the 10% is actually making. The hedge funds, the guys with the big pockets, right? Who don't take the leverage that you take. They, they're making 90% of the profits. Exactly. Right? Yeah. That's how it works. Is this... Um... That's why, to answer the question, that's why I never got into trading Bitcoin, yeah. right? I never traded my Bitcoin. I would never trade my Bitcoin because of these reasons, because I learned that from my career that trading is a bad idea. Just don't trade. <laughs> so hodling you got from TradeFi yeah. as a negative learning. Yes. So I never actually learned that hodling is the answer, but I knew that trading is not the answer. <laughs> 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 and I studied Bitcoin and I studied gold as well. I actually started with gold and then went to Bitcoin. And I, and, and I just looked at the chart and I obviously through my career, I also had learned how to read charts, do analysis on charts and stuff like that. And I did that with Bitcoin. I was like, at no point in this history could you have known when to time the market. It's impossible, right? But if you would just hold it, you would have made hundreds, if not thousands of percent. Mm. <laughs> That's a It's fascinating. I have yeah. in my, my ear now the, the power law guys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, ma I made an uh, episode with Giovanni uh, and it was really interesting how yes. he explains it. Uh, and then I also like asked, especially before I asked for some guests and for, for questions from the community and I did it also with Sailor and everyone like, yeah. ask, him for, ask him for the power law, ask him for the power law. And I'm like, yeah, sorry, I, I, I won't do that. I know his answer for that because he is the uh, opinion that every model will break at some point. It's just at some point, it's yes. It's just a matter of time. Yes. And for me, it's only like, hey, wh what happens to the Paolo model if the three top manager at Apple, uh, like Tim Cook and, and two others, decide why not put 10% uh, of our reserves in Bitcoin plus we will make out of our Apple Watch, our iPhone and the Mac and multi-signature wallet for everyone to mm. use and it will ship with the next generation. Yes. When this breaks tomorrow, what will the price do? <laughs> it will break the power model like in a day. <laughs> yes. So, so uh, it's interesting for me and just hodling is, is, the, best, uh, answer, uh, is the best thing. 100%. I agree totally. I uh, agree. Go ahead. You have um, uh, this this career in trade fire. Now you got into Bitcoin. What are you now doing in Bitcoin? So uh, I started with my co-founders in um, 2021. I because I told you about my background, right? Um, Iranian originally. So I met a few. Uh, I was looking for Bitcoiners who are from my country, like so desperately because there's so many altcoiners <laughs> from that region, from Dubai and from Iran. It doesn't matter where you go. They're all into altcoins, unfortunately. They're very far away from, tr from the truth, but time will change that, uh, hopefully. Anyway, so I met a few really, really nice Bitcoiners back in 2021. And we started this um, content platform called BitGuide. And on BitGuide, we started to publish content, which is Bitcoin only in Farsi. That was the start of what I do now. 
I mean, BitGuide is still there. We still do it with two of my uh, friends, but among them, uh, Sina and Zia, the three of us, we co-founded this company called 21st Capital in the beginning of this year. And basically, we believe that one of the most common issues in Bitcoin is custody. Mm. And the main reason people are hesitating still, especially people in their 40s and 50s, is because they're not sure how to custody Bitcoin. That's why the ETFs are such a big deal, right? Because everybody was saying, hey, custodying Bitcoin can be complicated for a lot of people. So the ETFs are going to be a huge thing, right? Which they are, obviously, but the world is big, right? Not a lot of people can access or want to access ETFs. And I don't believe ETFs are a good thing. And we can talk about that as well. But so what we want to achieve at 21st Capital is we want to give access to everybody, easy access to uh, self-custody. And we believe that the best way to do that is obviously education. That's one thing. But the other is, I believe, the future collaborative custody. Mm. Right. So we're working very hard at the moment. We are still not there yet. But I mean, we do, uh, you know, private sessions for for high net worth individuals who need help with their custody. We also do, you know, classes to very small number of people who really have specific questions and needs for themselves and their family members to learn about specific things that they still have a big question mark about Bitcoin and custodying it. Um, we're working very hard to make a platform where people can come to us and say, hey, I need help with custodying my Bitcoin. How can I do it? And what if I lose my keys? Right. That's the biggest problem. What do I do if I lose my keys? Right. So we're working on two solutions at the moment. One solution is um, a two out of three. So the client has two keys. We have one key in case the client loses a key. He still has us and he has another key. And the other solution is that we actually diversify and have an option that if the if, if something if the client loses both keys, that we can actually have a backup plan for the customer in case he has no access to any of his keys anymore. Right. Mm. And that's actually the innovating part. I think not a lot of people talk about this yet because it's pretty new in Bitcoin. Uh, not sure if you had guests who talk about mini scripts, but um, I think mini scripts are a complete game changer. They're going to change the way Bitcoin is custodied in the future. And um, the way it works is you can have a time lock of a certain period that a certain multi-sig will get activated if you don't move any money, which perfectly solves the issue of losing both of your keys or even you happening something to you and you want the money to, you know, go to your relative or whoever, right? So we do this, we help individuals, we're there for individuals, we help them with consulting and with custodying their Bitcoin. That's what we do right now. And even that alone, like this, this possibility of time locking a key yeah. is fascinating. And this yes. is all the, the advantages that come to money once it's digital. Exactly, because it's programmable money, it, it, right? It, it's fascinating for yes. me. Um, but it will be really hard to like um, distinguish in the future when we have CBDCs and, and they, then they sell all the good properties of Bitcoin with the one property they are missing with the sound monetary policy. But it will be interesting to see. Um, how do you see uh, adoption like when you have the traditional finance background investment banking background you talk with uh, bitcoiners you talk with people and onboard them ask uh, answer specific questions um what do you see as the one thing that maybe the bitcoin community has to do better or we can do better to drive adoption or or how do you see um, us making the bitcoin adoption better and driving it a little bit faster I would say argue less with each other. Try to come out of your bubbles 
Mm. Being very honest, because I really believe that we live in our podcast bubbles and conference bubbles and, you know, one fork here, one fork there. And should we have covenants? Should we not have covenants? And all these discussions that I don't think they're bad, but I don't think we it's necessary right now. Mm. Right. So I really believe Bitcoin is good enough for 10xing the number of users from here. I'm not even talking about price, like the users. We need more users. So in my opinion, what the Bitcoin, by the way, I'm not a fan of the word community. I don't believe there is such thing as a Bitcoin community because Bitcoin is such a big network right now that there's lots of Bitcoin communities. A lot of people, when you say Bitcoin community, they think of Bitcoin Twitter, <laughs> which can be very toxic and um, very, like intimidating to a lot of people. Uh, however, I do think that in the circles as we know them, there should be more talk and action towards building stuff that will gain more adoption towards people who want to adopt Bitcoin as a store of value. This is why at 21st Capital, we have actually put this as our priority we think that, um, and I have huge respect for people like Jack Mallers and, you know, what he's done with Strike with uh, all the Lightning projects are amazing. I love it. Like I use Lightning myself all the time, right? But I just believe in Lightning is necessary in places where Bitcoin is going to be needed as a medium of exchange, mm -hmm. right? But Lightning as of right now, because of the number of users we have right now, is, 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 is not first priority, in my opinion. First priority right now is let's enrich everyone by getting more adoption. And how do we get adoption? By getting the network filled with more users. How do we do that? We do that by building more convenient tools, by offering more services to high net worth individuals, people with a lot of money to feel, con to, to don't fear entering this network, right? So I see money in general as just a network. That's all it is, right? It's just a network, like a telephone. It's just a network, right? So we have right now the most dominant network in the world, which is the US dollar network. And what we need to do is to make sure our network is more convenient, is more friendly, and is more easy to access to as many dollar networkers as possible, right? And who are the, and I include everyone who has real estate, everyone who has, even gold is linked to the dollar, right? Because in order to get out of those assets, you need to buy the dollar. Sailor calls them a substitute, right? They're, they're just derivatives of the fiat currencies, right? So we need these users especially the large ones who have a lot of purchasing power. And I believe the focus should be on the store of value tools we have, build them out, sell as hard as we can. We need more salespeople in, 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 in Bitcoin. We have a lot of genius builders, but I think we need, I'm a salesperson, so I'm a fan of salespeople. I think Sailor is also an amazing salesperson. We need more salespeople, I think, and we need to convince the rich crowd, like people with a lot of money to get in, because as much as we want to say one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, I agree, but the dollar price matters. Mm. The number one marketing tool we have is the dollar price of Bitcoin, period. No discussion. Like for me, that's the, like, that's where, that's the reason most people get in. People, most people don't get in because they believe like, I mean, if you are in a rich country, if you live in Germany, if you live in the US, in these countries, you don't get into Bitcoin because you believe censorship is important to you, <laughs> right? You don't, you just simply don't do that because we're not used to censorship. If you live in a country like Turkey, probably, Iran, most probably. But if you live in Western countries 
And that's where the money is, guys. Like, let's focus on these folks. Like, they have the money. Let's get the money. <laughs> As Sailor <laughs> says, let's get the money first. We can worry about minimum exchange later. So that's my my take on that. Yeah, I also love the Sailor uh, part where he talked, like, I think it was like the second part of my podcast <clears throat> where he talked first about salespeople, like how yes. we, how you are a good salesperson in Bitcoin yeah. and how we should spread Bitcoin with love and not hate and not being against the dollars, but being for Bitcoin and all that stuff. But then also like uh, the China talk was really interesting for me when he talked about like, it's good when China adopts Bitcoin. It's another discussion if we want to revolutionize China and bring a free world to there. That That's not the Bitcoin mission. That's a whole nother level that we have to, like it's a noble uh, thing to do that, but we don't have to do it with Bitcoin. They can have Bitcoin and put their own restrictions on Bitcoin in their region. And when we're in, in the Western world, then we have a more free world and we can use the same Bitcoin and whatever China does, does not affect us. So that was a really interesting uh, thing to see. Um, before we get to our Andrew Dean, I have one yes. more um, area, a topic that I want to go with you. Um, you moved a lot, a lot, a lot around. Yes. <laughs> Dubai, Swiss, Germany, yes. Uh, yes. and now we're in Austria, yes. uh, even though you don't live here. Um, why did you move so much around and uh, what are you trying to find with the moving around? What, what's, your, what, what's your version of a great country? Great question. So let me start by saying the reason I moved was not necessarily because I chose the places I lived in, although they're very nice places, but most uh, of the places I've been was because I saw an opportunity because of work. So I did move to those places. But to, to tell you the truth, uh, this is a very subjective question as we discussed right before the podcast, right? It's very difficult. Like I'm on Clubhouse sometimes, the guys always keep talking about, hey, where should we live? Like what's the best place to live, right? It's very difficult to say because for example, let me give you an example. I lived in Dubai for like almost six years, right? And um, if you love nature, Dubai is a terrible place to be. <laughs> Just terrible because you don't have much there, right? You have the desert, you have camels and you have luxury. But that's it, right? If you love luxury, then obviously Dubai is an amazing place, right? Mm. Lovely place and relatively affordable for what you can get, right? So this is that and then there is immigration issues there is family issues or questions that you need to answer so my reason for moving around was i had an opportunity for work i didn't have any family members who hold me back or held me back i didn't have children you know i didn't have these kind of issues so i was free to move that's why i did it um right now we are considering also another move we don't know yet how and where but you know it's a very subjective topic it's very hard to answer to an individual so for example some people want to go to a place where it's very low tax right so they say you know dubai is zero tax i'm gonna go to dubai okay so who lives in dubai do you have anyone in dubai no okay so you're gonna be all by yourself not paying taxes do you want that right <laughs> like do you really want that right so so um taxes is one thing then then the other thing is okay what if i find a place where there is taxes but the taxes are reasonable they're not as high as in for example sweden or germany for example switzerland taxes but not high taxes mm. right nature yes Healthcare, if you care about healthcare, you have it. Um, not cheap at all, very expensive. That's the downside of Switzerland, but high income as well. So that's also another question. Are you a wealthy person who already has made it with a lot of Bitcoin or with a lot of money? Then also the question changes, right? If you are dependent on income, that also changes the equation, right? So for example, let me give you another example. If you are still on the income level of your balance sheet, right? You don't have a lot of wealth, but you have, you still 
uh, highly depend on your income, mm. right? Then probably Dubai is, um, uh, sorry, then probably a place like Switzerland is a good place, right? Because you can earn a lot in Switzerland, pay very low taxes on the income level, and it is expensive to live, <clears throat> but you can save in Switzerland. There's a lot of things you can do which will not cost you much, right? You can cook at home, for example, or you don't have to, you know, do things that are very expensive. But if you, for example, go to Dubai, uh, you're going to spend everything you earn <laughs> in Dubai, <laughs> you know, because there's no nature to, to, to enjoy for free. Everywhere you go, you're going to spend hundreds of dirhams, you know, which is a lot of money there, you know, so... It's a very subjective thing for me personally, to be honest, I love the sun. So that's the main reason I want to leave. Uh, like my wife and I, we both want to go somewhere where it's a little bit more warm mm -hmm. and um, we're considering it. We're not even sure if, you know, it's just a consideration for the next few years. But yeah, so uh, it's a difficult topic. Very, yeah. very difficult to answer. Depends on so many variables. Depends on your wealth level, depends on your income, depends even also on the language. Do you want to learn a new language? For example, Dubai, why I loved Dubai or and still one part of Dubai, which I really love is you don't need to learn another language, right? Everybody speaks English. Like if you speak Arabic, you actually have an issue in Dubai because no service person will, able, will be able to understand you, you know, because everybody is speaking English there. You know, so, mm. yeah, highly subjective. Um, I would just say whoever is listening, just do your own research, look at your preferences and decide accordingly. Amazing. Yeah, it, it's 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 an interesting topic. Yes. I've not dived into it at all. Like I lived in Germany. I lived here now in, in Austria. Where in Germany? Uh, Munich, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I live in Munich right now. Uh, I lived there. A year ago, uh, okay. since a year, I'm now in, in Austria, now I'm in Vienna. Um, cool. Last question before the end routine. Yes. Uh, the, it's kind of the end routine already. Uh, I, I put it to every guest nowadays. Um, what can yes. we learn from you <laughs> besides Bitcoin? What can you learn from me besides because, Bitcoin? Because I feel like I have so many yeah. uh, podcasts with Bitcoiners. But uh, we talk so much about Bitcoin and money and everything yes. like that. And I want to give this small wealth uh, in the end of the podcast where we can dive into a different topic. Uh, not, not long, <laughs> not like ours, but a small window in like what are Bitcoiners are doing mm -hmm. outside of Bitcoin. And then it's like, I, I last time phrased it like that what are you doing not related to Bitcoin? And I got like five comments, like everything is related to Bitcoin. <laughs> Which is true. <laughs> Which is true. Which is true. Um, but like, but what, I know what you, what you mean. What yeah. can we learn from you besides yes. Bitcoin? So, I mean, just to say this before I answer the question, Bitcoin is related to proof of work, mm. which means there is no free lunch, right? You might be an individual in your 20s, you do understand Bitcoin, but you're like, okay, everything sounds great, but I have to earn it, right? How do I earn the Bitcoin that I think I deserve, right? And to answer your question, I think what I have done in my 20s, I never prioritized fun. And I never prioritized... Um, even girls like uh, my first priority i don't want to say i didn't have any fun but my first priority because i wanted to live a life in my 30s that are easier than my 20s mm. i wanted to have a very tough 20s but less work in my 30s and even less work in my 40s most people choose it the other way because they think I'm only young once, so let me just enjoy life. I will figure this out later, right? They don't even think about Bitcoin. Forget about Bitcoin, right? They just don't, they just don't learn about discipline, 
hard work, not necessarily hard, but also smart work. You know, how can I make sure that when I enter my 30s, I can, I can be more independent, be, be more free and choose what I want instead of having to follow someone, someone's orders, right? That's the dream of everybody. Everyone wants that, but not a lot of people can do it because they lack the understanding that you need to have a lot of discipline. I don't want to say I'm a high disciplined person, but I really prioritize these things in my 20s. And that's why in my 30s, I have an easier life now. And this is, I think, I always try to teach whoever is in his 20s or even below his 20s to really prioritize this. You will regret it because as soon as you reach your 30s, you wish you had worked harder in your 20s because life will really suck. Like you will have such a terrible time to find a partner. You will have such a difficult time to do things you want to do. Mm. It's going to be really, really, really difficult. And the formula I found in my life, and I suggest everyone who is listening, go and read the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That's the book that changed my life. So Stephen R. Covey is the author. He talks about the four principles of life. One, your heart. Second, your mind. Third, your body. And fourth, your spirit. Which means um, the first one is, let's say, your body, which means eat clean food, don't eat trash, exercise regularly, and so on and so forth. Take care of the vehicle that God has given you, right? You're, you're only, like, this is the asset that's going to make you, you know, go on for hopefully tens of years, right? Number two, your heart. Have friends and family around, you know, be with them, spend time with them, you know, take care of your relationships, basically. Mm -hmm. Third, your mind, which is read, listen to podcasts like Robin's podcast, for example, listen to good podcasts, read books, educate yourself, keep learning, don't stop learning. I, I, I have met a lot of people, university, highly educated guys, thought when they got their degree, they're done. <laughs> That's when life starts, dude. That's when life starts. After you get your degree, Actually, the learning starts from there, right? Don't stop learning, mm. right? That's the mind. The spirit, have some form of connection with God. You, want to, you can call it God, you can call it the universe, you can call it whatever. If it's not religion for you, I'm not a religious person. Some people are. If that helps, great. If it doesn't, also fine, you know? But have something that takes you back to yourself to the present, out of your ego, know that it's all a game we're playing. We're just here for a time. We're all going to be gone at some point. Let's have fun playing this human game we're playing and come back to that realization from time to time and realize that we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Oh. <laughs> I love it a lot. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's what I love about that question. Uh, and it's, it opens up new uh, areas and a whole new, like if you tune in right now, you think you are in a whole different podcast than like 20 minutes ago. Yes, that's true. <laughs> yes. It's a whole different thing. Yes. Um, our end routine, our actual end routine is uh, where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who actually the next guest is. Okay. Uh, and the question for you, uh, what is your uh, biggest learning that you had because of Bitcoin? And we already had like two, three things that you could have yes. said when we did not <laughs> say it before. Can you read the question again? What is the... What is your biggest learning yes. that you had because of Bitcoin? Yes. Not about Bitcoin, but because of Bitcoin. Yes. My biggest learning from Bitcoin has been that... 
the definition of freedom. Mm. I actually never knew what freedom is before Bitcoin. Never had it. Never knew I didn't have it. Never knew that. I thought I'm free. But I thought I am, but I wasn't. And with Bitcoin, it's the most insane transformation in anyone's mind. I mean, in my mind, it was the most insane it was even bigger than the moment i had some spiritual awakening moments you know mm. when meditating and stuff like that because it, it it connected the worlds for me you know and it's the feeling that you finally realize oh my god like this thing sets you free from any from anyone above you that you thought you had to follow, including all of your heroes. Yeah, like all of my heroes died after I learned about Bitcoin. All of them. I realized, actually, I don't need anyone. <laughs> like I, I, can, I can actually be, like obviously we are inter, in, interconnected uh, beings, right? Mm -hmm. I, I know that we are all interconnected. All of us are, right? But from a from a freedom point of view you don't need to ask anybody to be anywhere with bitcoin right finally i don't have to ask for permission to be in germany i don't need to ask for permission to leave germany right if i was an individual who had let's say a couple of thousand dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars and i would be all invested in real estate I would be trapped. Like, where the heck do you want to go? You want to you want to just leave Germany? Good luck. Try to get out without paying hundreds of thousands of taxes, which doesn't mean you should avoid taxes. All I'm saying is just that the optionality that Bitcoin gives you is one thing that I learned. And the other thing is I started to connect with a lot of people that are so diverse from so many different regions. For example, uh, you're you're now you know you're in your twenties. I'm in my late thirties. Because you know about Bitcoin and I know about Bitcoin, we meet for the first time in Prague, and we instantly connect. Mm. Right? Th like, how is that without Bitcoin even possible? Like, you have to know the person somehow. But because you knew I'm a Bitcoiner. We instantly connected and you were like, come on our podcast. And I'm like, sure, <laughs> you know, let's do it. Let's do it. So, so I would say freedom and relationships. These are the two things that Bitcoin, I would, I thought I knew about, but taught me again. I love it a lot. Uh, and it's, it's been such a great pleasure to talk with you. Likewise. Before I let you go, uh, where can people find you, ask you questions uh, if they want to go deeper with you? Yes. So um, the website of our company is 21st with 21, 21ST Capital, C A P I T A L Capital dot com, 21st Capital dot com. This is the website of our company. Uh, you can find my profile on our website. You should probably check my profile from our website because there can be some scammers on, on Twitter, as you know. Yes. But on Twitter, it's RKBTC, where, I'm, where I can be found. And um, Robin, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>